Aloha students, how are we doing today? Nice to see you. Um, we're going to sort of get into the last part of our school year, the last, dare I say, unit. Uh, it is called the Renaissance. This is sort of uh, what most historians, not sort of, this is what most historians consider the beginning of the modern era. Of course, my class, my elective class is called Modern World History. Uh, historians basically use the date 1492 and this time period called the Renaissance to say this is the beginning of modern times. The Middle Ages comes to an end and modern times begin. So I'm going to discuss the Renaissance and what I think is one of the most famous uh, pieces of artwork of the Renaissance, a piece called The Last Judgment to sort of demonstrate it. All right, here we go. All right. Um, the Renaissance and the Last Judgment. Okay, so follow along. Uh, the term, the word Renaissance, an Italian word, it basically means rebirth. The rebirth of what? Well, it is the rebirth of human culture after the Middle Ages. Maybe, just maybe, you recall a sort of timeline graph we did back in the day, sort of the beginning of this whole uh, learning from home. Remember this thing, everybody? The Middle Ages, the graph of human culture uh, that we did way back at the start of this whole thing. And if you recall, my graph of human culture went up, 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 and at the fall of the Western Roman Empire, culture fell. And that was partly because the Romans, the, uh, the Western Roman side fell, but the Roman Empire fell, and the uh, they were very highly cultured. They had a road system and a trade system that was highly efficient. And the roads and the, uh, and the trade system uh, faltered, and then thus the movement of goods and services certainly stopped, but the movement of ideas stopped as well. And so you have this dip in culture. But I have made a point as well that there are a lot of cultural things. I think Gothic cathedrals and those types of things certainly are cultural. You read a famous reading from the time period. But then we get to the Renaissance, and we sort of again like this is about a thousand year period that this Middle Ages went on, and here we are going forward. And you can see the Renaissance really jumped. So hopefully you recall this. And so again, rebirth, rebirth of what? The rebirth of culture. And we usually associate the Renaissance with the uh, with uh, Southern Europe, but especially we associate it with the country of Italy, all right? Uh, the Renaissance happened all over Europe, but mostly we think of Italy as where it flourished the most. Why? Well, shocking, Mr. O'Brien, uh, it ha uh, would say this, it has to do with geography. Uh, it's the center of trade of all of the Mediterranean world. I'm going to show you another map. Hopefully you remember this one. You recall the old Roman Empire, ladies and gentlemen? Well, there was an old, old saying, the Romans were great road builders, and there was an old saying, all roads lead to Rome. And if you sort of look at it, like if you're going to go from Spain to Judea, what would be logical to do? Stop in Rome. If you were going from Egypt to Gaul, what would be logical? Stop it. So the point is, is all these trade routes, whether they be overland or by sea, you can kind of see that Rome was the natural place just because of its geography where lots of trade would go on. And that's exactly what happened. Rome became a huge trading center, like I said, that famous saying. So when it's time for culture to be reborn, and look, after, uh, I think a lot of this has to do with Remember, the uh, Crusaders were coming back from the Middle East with new products, and people were interested in that. Uh, the Europeans were interested in that. Marco Polo came back from a Asia, and people were interested in that. And we talked about how the Mongols opened up east to west. So what do you have? You have a bunch of wealthy merchants. Remember the term merchants, traders? Uh, and so these merchants have... Uh, become super wealthy as trade comes back and um, these merchants buy nice houses and they look around their houses and they go it's a great house but uh, the walls are kind of bare we need some artwork around here I would say there's another letter B there's another reason why Italy became the center of culture it's because there's a here's another uh, institution that has a lot of money the Roman Catholic Church is headquartered as you know in Rome and they had been collecting taxes uh, for a thousand years by this time and so the coffers of the Roman Catholic Church were very full with money and so they were building new churches um, and sure enough 
you know, these priests are walking around and they're saying, oh boy, this church is really nice, but it's sort of boring in here. We need artwork on the walls. And so my point is, there is a market. There is a market for artwork, whereas before there was not. All right? All right, so let's do these new artistic techniques. I think you may recall these from the other day when we talked about the School of Athens and we talked about uh, the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci. Maybe you recall perspective, all right? Remember, perspective was to create depth on a flat surface. Uh, shadowing was number two. Do you see now why I wanted you to draw railroad tracks going off in the distance into a tunnel? That was the whole point of that activity was to do that. So the railroad tracks, you should have drawn them sort of going like that. I have, I put my copy away. Uh, and of course, shadowing, that's the tunnel. So uh, hopefully your uh, drawing doesn't look like a space invader or a mushroom or something or a ladder going up to uh, something. Hopefully it looks something like uh, what I'm talking about here. Number three was anatomical realism. I talked about that having to do with Leonardo da Vinci uh, and his autopsies and the Vitruvian man and, and all these guys, all these guys who did this artistic stuff, they were interested in realism. Remember, the Greeks and the Romans wanted to do things, the, the perfect human body. The Renaissance artists wanted to do realistic human bodies. I talked about secular themes, things that are non-religious. My example was the School of Athens. The School of Athens uh, is about a really a pagan society, but the uh, a pagan polytheistic society, but the Roman Catholic Church paid for that painting. So that was a secular theme that Raphael was able to accomplish. Um, and and maybe you see something sort of interesting here. This is difficult because. This who are, who's paying who's paying these uh, who is paying these artists and I'm going to come back to this in a moment the Roman Catholic Church but the guy these guys want to sneak in secular themes they loved historical stuff especially the Greeks alrighty and then I commented about you take people from your own time period and put them into the artwork as someone else and that was my example was. Uh, if you want to go back and review that briefly, my example was Raphael put Leonardo da Vinci into the painting School of Athens and Leonardo da Vinci starred as Plato. So that was to honor da Vinci, um, that was to honor da Vinci as somebody who Raphael saw as important. Uh, Self-portraits within the larger work, we saw how Raphael did that, we're going to see that in a moment here how Michelangelo does that. And if you recall, if you recall, I said there was a number seven. And then I said, come back tomorrow and you'll find out what number seven is. All right. Da, 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 da. Here it comes. Number seven is a frozen moment in time. Whoa. Holy moly, what is that? Okay, well, let me give you, let me give you an example here in just a few moments, okay? A frozen moment in time. Does not sound fascinating. Okay, so, let me continue. Draw a line across there. Draw a line across there. Here we go, I'll come back to some of this stuff in just a second. Okay, so, uh, Renaissance artists like to challenge authority, and, and, I, and I would just sort of say artists generally, artists generally like to push the edge, don't they? They like to push um, what is accepted. They like to push boundaries. That's how artists have always been. That's how artists always will be. Uh, artists are good for society because sometimes they push a society to beyond its boundaries. All right? So... The point of this is that sort of what is sort of interesting is that what is the main authority at this particular moment in time? And I'm kind of repeating myself here, but this is a little sort of the authority is the Roman Catholic Church. This is the natural authority to challenge at this particular moment in history. Well, what I'm sort of made this point, this is difficult. Because who is the main mark? Who is one of the main markets 
for Renaissance art, for these artists' artwork at this time? Well, it's the Roman Catholic Church. So how do you do this? How do you sneak in secular themes into religious works? Remember, secular is non-religious. All right. Uh, again, the School of Athens is not sneaking it in, but how do you? How can an artist sneak in some secularism into a religious work that the Roman Catholic Church wants? Well, the best example of this is a very famous painting called The Last Judgment, and this is painted by a guy named you've all heard of Michelangelo. Now, the Last Judgment is in the Sistine Chapel. S-I-S-T-I-N-E, the Sistine Chapel. And the Sistine Chapel is uh, right in Vatican City, which is a... Vatican City is actually its own country, if you will, in the middle of the city of Rome. And that's where it has... Literally, it's its own country. Uh, smaller than a small city that's smaller inside... Smaller than the city of Rome. The Sistine Chapel is most famous for Michelangelo's painting of the ceiling. All right, now the Last Judgment is not on the ceiling, it is on, I'm going to show it to you in just a moment, the Last Judgment is on the wall behind the altar. All right, now here is the point. Uh, my number seven, which I was going to try to tell you, I uh, was going to, about to tell you all about. Number seven is a frozen moment in time, right as Christ demands quiet before the final judgment. So this is... Uh, uh, the end of the Bible, the book of Revelations, this is the very end. If you think about the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling is the beginning of the Bible. It's, it's Genesis and the stories of the Old Testament. The Last Judgment is the end of the Bible, Revelations, uh, where uh, everybody is finally judged. That's what I mean, the Last Judgment. And what happens is this frozen moment as, this frozen moment as Christ demands quiet before judgment of all people. Uh, uh, let me this, I'm sorry about this, of humanity occurs, okay? All right, now, let's take a look at it, shall we? Okay, so, here is, ladies and gentlemen, here is a picture of the Sistine Chapel itself. And I've been there, it's really cool. It's about, I think, I, I walked in this door right here when I came in, and I spent about 45 minutes in there, and I, enter, I exited out of here. It was completely packed. It was, uh, my neck was very sore at the end. But you can see here that uh, it's about 60 feet floor to ceiling. Uh, that's why your neck is sore when you're done. For example, you can see the creation of Adam right there. Did everybody notice that? Let's sneak in on that one. So you should recognize that. It's sort of a vaulted ceiling. And up on the front wall, on the altar up there, you can see this is the Last Judgment. So let's take a little bit closer look at that. Here it is. This is the Last Judgment. Let's widen this out. Okay? Uh, and you can see there's the door, and there's a little thing, a shelf back here. There's a door and a door. Okay, so it's up on the wall behind the altar. All right, now. Let's go through some of these artistic techniques that we uh, have been talking about. Let's start with perspective. Well, perspective, if you recall the other day, I was talking about how um, some paintings have hard lines, some have soft lines. So what are your eyes drawn to every time? Well, it, to me, they're drawn to this character right here who's waving his arms. All right, well, who the heck is that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the Christ. That is Jesus Christ himself. And if you take a look, what he is basically doing is he is yelling for quiet. He's just, the words either quiet or silence, and he's waving his arms to get everybody to be quiet so last judgment can be given. How do we know this is Christ? Well, if you zoom in here a little bit, and you take a look at that, you see his hand. You see the, do you see the red mark in his hand? You see the red marks on his feet. These are from the crucifixion. Remember the Romans stabbed him in the side. All right, so the frozen moment. All right, now, when you hear somebody yell out loud, what do you do? You turn and look. Okay, so let's take a look at this perspective, and if you look very carefully here, guess what all the people around him are doing? They're turning to look. So you see 
this guy right here. So here's my trusty ruler, and take, check out the eye lines of all these guys, all these people around him, right? See that? And you come down here, and sure enough, see this person, this person right here? And if you come over here, see this guy? And then you see this guy? And then all these people, I'll go over here, and you see how this all works? So this is, this is soft line perspective. And I think that, that also, again, the point, this is on a flat surface, okay? What do you notice about the lighting? Well, it's lighter near the top and it's darker near the bottom because uh, the top is, going, is more towards heaven and this is more towards the place where you don't want to go. Uh, this is the place where you want to avoid down here. HE, what I call HE double hockey sticks. Alrighty? Um, you can see there's a lot of people that don't have very much clothing on. Uh, a lot of anatomical realism. Alrighty? And you can see that that is a very big, major part of it. So, uh, that's secular, that's sort of secular. The nudity is sort of the secular aspect of it. Okay? Alright, now let's take a look at two other things as we go through this. First of all, I want to talk about the self-portrait. Well, Michelangelo included a self-portrait, and I want you to take kind of a look right here at this guy. What the heck is that right there? Well, that is the self-portrait. This thing right here is the self-portrait of Michelangelo. It's just his skin. Everything else is gone. All that's left of him is his skin. And what I wanted to tell you about was, why is it like this? Why did he do this? Well, he thought that the uh, Sistine Chapel was one of the most difficult things he ever did in his life. First of all, he considered himself a sculptor. Uh, he didn't necessarily consider himself a painter. Uh, this is the second project. He did the ceiling when he was a younger uh, adult. And he almost died doing that. He, that took four years to do that. And he almost died up there on the scaffolding and the fumes and everything. And then in this one, he was constantly being criticized. This was later when he's older. Uh, he came back to this building to do this. And so in this uh, situation, during this project, he was being criticized. He was criticized during the ceiling project as well for all the nudity. And people would come in and say, you can't put nudes in a Catholic church. You can't put nude people. That's blasphemous. And his argument was, how did God send us into this world? We're new. And so he wanted everybody to know, he wanted everybody to know that this job took the soul out of him. It took his, it, it took everything out of him. All that was left, he wanted everybody to remember that all that was left of him because his soul was taken out of him in these, in this, these two projects in this building. I would also sort of throw out to you the one about putting people from your own time period. Well... Guess what he did with some of his critics? This is actually kind of funny. All right, so here you have sort of a devil-looking figure. These people are crossing the river to get into HE double hockey sticks. Well, guess what he did with uh, some of his critics? He included their portraits in, <laughs> in this group of people. So he kind of got back at his critics for all time by leaving them there. Okay? Um, uh, let me, uh, before, I, before I come back to the written part, let me just throw this out at you. I'll give you another example of a... School of Athens is not really a frozen moment in time, but I would say to you um, that Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Judgment is a frozen moment in time. What do I mean by that? Well, if you take a look at this thing, what's the big moment, what's the big moment of The Last Supper? The big moment is when Christ announces, someone will betray me. One of you will betray me. So if you look at him right there, he's literally, those things have just left his mouth. The words have just left his mouth. And what da Vinci has done is, is he's frozen the moment in time with the reaction of the disciples to that. And you can see the groups of three. Look at these guys in shock over here. This guy's going, oh, it's not me, not me. Uh, these guys, who could it be? Who could it be? Judas reels back. He's saying to himself, I can't believe he knows. Here's these three guys. Look, here's one. This is Simon. Uh, this is Peter. Simon Peter right here says, is it me, Lord? Am I going to be the one? And here are these three. Look, their reaction. How could he say that about us? How is that possible? So again, this is another example of a frozen moment in time that 
Renaissance artists like to do. All right. Now, how might this have been? How is this painted? And maybe you notice, uh, and a lot of this stuff, look at these cracks. What is going on here? Well, I want to describe to you how this works. Okay. This is called. This is on. This is this is not a painting that is hanging on the wall. This is a painting that is painted onto the wall. And dare I say, it's painted into the wall. Now let me see if I can explain. This is how a fresco is done, okay? So let's say that on this particular, on whatever particular day, Michelangelo is ready to paint the Christ figure. So what he does is at a separate location, he has a workshop and at his workshop, he has paper. And basically what he does is he sketches a big, huge poster with pencil and he sketches exactly the outline of this figure that he's going to paint on a particular day. Okay? When he's done with his poster paper, he takes a pin, P-I-N, and he makes little holes through his poster on the outline of the body of what he wants to draw. Okay? The day he's ready to go paint it at the Sistine Chapel, he has his assistants and they go up on the ladders first. And what they do is they put plaster on the wall. You know, plaster sometimes. Like back in the day when I was a kid, we'd, we'd have broken limp, broken arms or broken wrists or broken legs. We'd get a plaster cast. So plaster starts off wet and then it hardens. And that's exactly what they did. So the assistants get up there and they put plaster up and it's wet, right? Michelangelo comes in. He puts his poster, he unrolls his poster down in front of the wet plaster. And remember, it has pins along the outline. And he takes charcoal or something like that and he rubs his poster with the charcoal. Now, what does the charcoal do through the pinholes? Some of the charcoal goes through the pinholes. You pull the poster away, and what do you have left on the wet plaster? You have this outline. So now he's ready with his paints, and what does he do? He paints this figure onto the wet plaster. So the paint is wet, the plaster is wet. When he's done, when he's satisfied, what does he do? He leaves, and he lets it dry. And what does the paint do? it dries into the wall. So this is not a painting on a wall, this is a painting in a wall. Right? And that's why you sometimes see cracks in the wall because the wall is old, the building is old. So The Last Judgment has a lot of these cracks as well. Okay, now, the last thing I'll sort of tell you about in this picture is I want you to check out this piece of clothing right here. Look at that. How does that piece of clothing perfectly cover that figure's uh, you know what? And then you go across here and you look at this, this guy, both of these guys. Somehow they have pieces of clothing that perfectly cover their particular private parts. But they don't seem to be attached to anything on the side. They just happen to be there. Okay, so what the heck is going on? I thought we were, you know, Michelangelo's painting nudes here. All right, well, in the 1980s, in the 1980s, the Sistine Chapel was redone. So here's another... Here's another view of it. Uh, it was not redone, I should say. It was cleaned. It was refurbished. It was uh, cleaned up. So here, I'll give you just a couple of these. You take a look, you can kind of see the difference. Uh, it's a church. It, you know, you burn candles in churches. Uh, and the church, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the smoke goes up. And you can see how filthy and dirty some of these things were. And in the 1980s, they basically cleaned it. And you can sort of see the difference here in these things. One of the things that they found very interesting when they got to the Last Judgment was is that they found a lot of areas in which there was painting, and I just described to you how a fresco is in the wall, there was paint on the wall, okay? And at every single occasion where they, there was paint on the wall, it was these pieces of clothing that I described to you just a moment ago. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us that Sometime after the completion of the Last Judgment, probably after Michelangelo has died and passed away, a subsequent pope later on has commissioned another artist to go up on the wall and do what? Paint clothing on the nudes. And that's why in every single case that you see this sort of red, red, those are places where the painting is on the wall, not in the wall. Every single case, it's a piece of clothing. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, and now just to sort of finish this off, one of the most important things I want to talk about here is when everybody turns to look 
Okay? When everybody turns to look after the fight after Christ calls for quiet, the people have looks of uncertainty. Oh my gosh, am I gonna to go to heaven or am I gonna to go to H E double hockey sticks? What's what's gonna to happen to me? Which where am I going? I need to know what is happening to me, so I'm uncertain. And the Roman Catholic Church did not like that because the Roman Catholic Church wants to be seen as stable and solid for all human beings. The Roman Catholic Church was making the argument that if you just come to church every Sunday and if you put money in the collection plate, you'll go to heaven. Michelangelo is saying, no, 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 that's not enough. You need to be a good Catholic. You need to be a good and pious Catholic and do of the things that Christ wants you to do and live a good life, it's got to be more than just coming to church every day. Uh, I would also sort of say uh, one of the things that Michelangelo did is he used the Christ figure a little differently. If you go back and look at the Christ figure, he's sort of buff, isn't he? And most of the time when we think about how the Christ figure is painted, he's thin and emaciated. In this case, you can see that the Christ figure, uh, number one, was muscular. Number two, has no beard. So he's purposely going against how the Roman Catholic Church specifically wants Christ portrayed to sort of be, go uh, against their authority. The nudity is the most important thing, I would say, is the secular aspect of this. Uh, all of the nudes in the Sistine Chapel. And of course, I said, Michelangelo included his critics in the work, specifically some going down. Okay, everybody? All right, so that's the Renaissance. Uh, Hopefully you um, can pull those all together, kind of the things we did with the Renaissance art techniques and then the Last Judgment. Um, I hope you enjoyed this discussion about the Renaissance. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Italy, you should take it. Uh, there's, it's amazing, uh, especially the Sistine Chapel if you ever get a chance to go. An amazing place. All right. Uh, thank you, students. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for always going through these movies. Um, I hope you've enjoyed them. Talk to you tomorrow. Aloha.